Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb. I'm your host, Erin Landon, a Washington State University Extension Master Gardener since 2015 and a certified permaculture designer and modern homesteader. I'm here to share up-to-date research-based horticulture and environmental stewardship knowledge to help you grow and manage your garden and to share what the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is all about. WSU Extension Master Gardener volunteers are university-trained community educators who have been cultivating plants, people, and communities since 1973. Are you ready to grow? Let's dig into today's episode. Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb, episode 17. My guest today is Laurel Moulton, and she's here to talk to us about integrated pest management in the vegetable garden. Laurel is a self-proclaimed plant appreciator who has spent the majority of her life immersed in the flora and fauna of the Pacific Northwest bioregion. She loves working with farmers and gardeners in her work with WSU Extension. She is a master gardener coordinator in Clallam County and an integrated pest management specialist with the WSU Regional Small Farms Program serving Clallam, Jefferson, and Kitsap counties, and a member of the statewide WSU Integrated Pest Management Team. Laurel, thanks so much for joining me today. Welcome to the show. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. All right. So to start off, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do for WSU Extension? Yeah, I, I'm Laurel Moulton. I I work out of Port Angeles in Clallam County where I coordinate our Master Gardener program, and I also work for the the regional small farms program that serves Clallam, Jefferson, and Kitsap County. And through that program, I do technical assistance with integrated pest management for small farms and, you know, coordinate um, educational events and do some on-farm research. So since you're here to talk to us about integrated pest management, let's start off with what that is. Yeah, we we throw out that that name IPM, the acronym, um, but what it means is um, an ecosystem based strategy that focuses on long term prevention of pests or their damage through a combination of techniques. The pest control methods are selected and applied in a manner that minimizes risk to human health, non target organisms, and the environment. And when pesticides are used, they're only used after monitoring indicates that they're needed. Okay. And why is that important for vegetable gardening specifically? Um, It's important for vegetable gardening because, you know, if you aren't thinking about the tools that you're using, you can do, um, you can do harm uh, to good organisms, to people, to pets, the environment. And so why not deal with pests and diseases in a way that, that keeps everything else as healthy as you can. So it's just a, it's good to be gentle on the environment. So what are the the components or the aspects of integrated pest management? Well, first and foremost, um, this doesn't, doesn't seem like, like you'd have to say it, but uh, first you should make sure you know exactly what the pest or disease is that you're dealing with because you don't, you don't know what to do about it until you know what it is. And once you identify that pest or disease, you can understand it's a life cycle and find the most direct way to manage that problem, you know, targeting a pest at its most vulnerable stage. So so identifying the pest and then you monitor the pest population, see what it's doing. Is it are there really enough pests or really enough um, active disease to to be a problem for you? Um, and then you develop your thresholds and basically that is what kind of damage is acceptable to you. Um, I know I personally eat a, a lot of pretty ugly Brussels sprouts, but you just peel off those leaves and they're fine. But but a farmer who had to sell those at the grocery store uh, might have to worry um, a lot more about having perfect Brussels sprouts. So so after you figure out what the pest is, um, decide whether it's a problem and decide your thresholds, then you employ a combination of management tools um, and you time those for maximum effect. And then, of course, you assess um, how your system is working. What are the techniques in integrated pest management to apply it in the garden? Yeah, so you want to use a combination of different types of tools. And so the first and I think the most important one is cultural techniques. So an example of some of those are um, 
timing when you put the plant in the ground, purchasing pest-free materials or, you know, importing pest-free materials, employing techniques that reduce stress on your plants, using rotation, trap cropping, habitat modification, and uh, sanitizing. Um, You can also use biological tools. So that might include enhancing naturally occurring beneficial pests or, you know, making a situation that's better for them. It could include importing beneficial pests to help you with the pests. And then there's, there's some other ones, but I'll just focus on those two. Then you can use mechanical tools, physical barriers, things like that. Um, And then, of course, chemicals, whether they're organic or conventional, depending on your gardening philosophies, um, can be employed as well. So you would you would use a, a combination of those. So what are some common pests that affect vegetable gardens and how can we attempt to manage them? Well, um, since the Pacific Northwest is so good for growing cabbage and broccoli and um, other things in that family, I guess I'll start with with cabbage root maggots. Um, cabbage root maggots are actually the larvae of a fly. When you When you hear something referred to as a maggot, that is just the common term for the larvae of a fly. Um, and those are the little white uh, maggots that get into the roots of, of your radishes or your broccoli or anything like that. They can make your, your crop inedible, you know, in the case if you get a heavy infestation in radishes or, or those l- tasty little white turnips. Um, but for, some, for a bigger plant like broccoli or cabbage, you might not notice the damage unless it was heavy. And then in that case, the plant would just be stunted. So for those critters, um, we know that as a fly, we know that the larvae um, inhabit the roots underground, so they're really hard to get at. And so the point in the life cycle of that insect um, that you would target is, is when the female is laying the eggs on the soil surface next to your plant. You want to prevent that. Knowing what the pest is, what the life cycle is, then you decide, okay, um, I want to prevent egg laying next to the plant. So there's a couple tools you can use. Um, you can use floating row cover, and you just have to make sure that that's, uh, you know, secured well to the ground so they can't get underneath. Um, and there's some other techniques as well, like some people put little cardboard collars um, around around their cabbage plants and things like that. Yeah, so that's that's pretty much the best one is <laughs> is uh, putting up a barrier. Um, we don't recommend using chemicals because th- there are very few chemicals uh, available to for gardeners that that work in the soil, and they would probably damage your other soil organisms. So um, prevention is the best. Um, another cultural technique you can use for that, um, actually, a couple cultural techniques are. Um, Making sure you pull up your your brassicas that are in the ground for a while, so um, you aren't leaving, uh, you know, leaving some of the you know the the maggots in the soil to pupate. You can get those out of the system. Um, you want to rotate crops because if you grow brassicas in the same place for multiple years in a row, you might already have the pupa of those um, root maggots. In the soil, and so when the adults hatched out of the pupa, they would be underneath that row cover already, and so that kind of, you know, makes your row cover useless except to keep them in. I know. Well, this is the not the root maggot, but the the larvae of the cabbage moth. Mm-hmm. For me, I manually. I mean, as long as it's not too big of an infestation, I just pull them off and feed them to my chickens. Yeah, yeah, I I definitely do that too. So. Um, the, the cabbage moth, and then there's also, um, there's also a cabbage butterfly. So the, the bright green kind of fuzzy one, that's a, that's those white cabbage butterflies. Um, and the, the larvae of the moths are, are darker in color. Um, and so, yeah, I, I do the same thing. I, I pick those big fat, fat suckers off and I feed them to the chickens. Um, and the chickens love it. But it depends on your garden size and the amount of time that you have. That's a good physical technique. Um, I found with those guys, sometimes there's so many larvae on the plant and they still do damage when they're really small and harder to find. Or if you have a a large garden or or a homesteader or a small farmer, um, you may not (laughs) have the luxury that we take of walking, you know, strolling through the vegetable garden and feeding our chickens. So 
you can also use row cover for those, but row cover gets a little bit unwieldy um, when your plants are bigger. Um, but you can also, a, a good option for that is um, there's actually a chemical management tool, which is Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacterial, uh, a bacterial um, pesticide that's certified for organic use. To me, it's one of the best types of pesticides you can have because it it only um, affects caterpillars in the moth and butterfly family that consume it. And so if you think of the types of caterpillars that are on your cabbage, the only ones you're going to find are cabbage moths or cabbage butterflies. Um, the, uh, the toxin doesn't last long in the environment. So you know, you'll read the label and it says how often you have to reapply it. But anyway, the gist of it is it's extremely targeted to that specific pest and it won't harm other organisms. So what about other problems in the garden like fungus or soil-borne pathogens? I'm going to, I'll start with um, foliar fungal diseases because those are a little bit easier to deal with than, than diseases that are found in the soil. So if you have foliar fungal infections, or um, there's some organisms that we used to refer to as, as fungus-like orna- organisms, like downy mildew and um, uh, late blight and tomatoes, those are actually not related to fungus. They're more closely related to brown algae, but they're treated um, similarly to fungus. So with those, with those foliar diseases, um, well, first of all, I guess... Uh, you'll have to think of what we call the disease triangle. The three sides of the triangle, one is the disease organism on one side. Uh, Another side of the triangle is the environment that that organism can survive in. Um, And then the uh, the third leg of the triangle is the host. And so they can only, those diseases can only exist if all three legs of the triangle are there. So if you can take out the host, then you don't have the disease. If you can take out the conditions that that it thrives in, but you still have the host um, and the pathogen present, the disease won't occur. So with those, you know, it's important to identify the disease because that there are some diseases that that we are more worried about than others, like uh, black leg and cabbage, which is a which is a quarantine disease, um, and there's others that are just you know around like like. Uh, gray mold or botrytis. First and foremost, a cultural technique you can have is just being careful about what material you're you're bringing into your garden. <clears throat> so if you go to the garden center and you see those kind of sad looking plants on the sale table, um, it's really tempting as gardeners to want to buy those and and baby them and bring them back to health. But it's smarter to actually buy a plant that's healthy um, and from a reputable source. So you aren't bringing uh, a disease or a pest unintentionally into your garden that you didn't have before. So that's number one. Number two, you can do things like I mentioned habitat modification. And this is one that I didn't think about until um, recently. But when you're designing your garden, you can design your garden um, with the direction of the wind in mind. So for example, you know, with these fungal diseases, getting lots of um, airflow through your garden is a good thing. So the moisture doesn't sit on leaves. Um, so you could decide to, to um, design your garden so that the rows went with the direction of the wind and you'd, you'd have more flow through that way. So yeah, once you get the disease, what you can do is, you know, sometimes you can pick off leaves and prevent the spread. If you reach the end of the season and you've had, it, you've had a disease in your garden, those foliar diseases typically most times can't perpetuate without a host. And so if you compost them using hot compost or you till them into the soil, um, that goes a long way to, to breaking the, the life cycle. Um, and then of course there's, there's some things that you just, you just may need to use a fungicide, um, if it gets bad enough. Another, another thing with the wind is if you've had an infestation of a particular disease, um, on a crop in one part of your garden, um, you can take advantage of the wind by the next year planting um, in an upwind location. So if there are spores that are still around, 
they're going to be blowing the opposite way of the crop that year. So just planning where your rotations are in relation to where a disease occurred in your garden before. That's that's getting kind of high level, but it's it's a tool you can use. So so you'd asked about soil borne diseases. With those ones, <laughs> depending on what they are, uh, I would avoid them if you can. Prevention, prevention, prevention. Um there's there's certain things um like uh, club root, for example, while we're talking about brassicas, I think this whole show is going to be about brassicas. Um, there's a disease out there called club root. Um, and once it gets in your soil, it can infect all things in the brassica family, um, some to a greater extent than others. And it can live in your soil for almost 20 years. That That's, that's definitely one that you um, want to keep out of your garden. So whether that is when you visit a friend's garden who you know has that disease, don't use your tools there and then bring them home or, you know, clean your shoes, things like that. What does the timing of planting in the garden, um, how does that affect pest activity and um, disease? That's a, that's a great question. Um, timing is one of those cultural tools that you can use um, to have a healthier garden in the first place. If you're planting um, a plant in a time where it can't grow, you know, it doesn't have rapid growth um, and that's not ideal for it, it's just going to be less healthy. It's going to be more susceptible to diseases and pests. I like to give the example of I, I had a neighbor who loved loved that she could get her tomatoes out in the garden earlier than anybody else. And she did that by um, putting wall of water uh, things around each tomato and using row cover and and just babying each plant. And um, at the time I lived next to her, I was a relatively new gardener and also, I don't know, lazy, didn't have time, whatever. But I, I didn't get my tomatoes planted until much later in the season. But accidentally, I, I did the right thing because I, I put mine out when it was ready for, you know, when the temperatures and moisture levels were were really good for tomatoes. And so I found that the tomatoes I put in the ground a month later than she did caught up with hers almost immediately um, because her plants had just been sitting in the soil, just barely, you know, just surviving, but not thriving. Um, So if you can wait for a time where you can put that plant in the ground and it takes off growing, it's going to be healthier. Um, It can outgrow the impacts of some diseases like that's, you know, going back to the cabbage root maggot, if you have a healthy, a larger, healthier plant that's growing quickly, you may be able to, it can tolerate damage from, from some, some root maggots. Yeah. So put things in at the right time when the conditions are right. So are there other cultural practices that we can use to prevent pests and diseases? Yeah, absolutely. Um, One thing I love to advocate is um, testing your soil and basing your fertility regime on your soil test. Just besides integrated pest management, I see so many people um, putting all sorts of, um, I don't know, tasty fertilizer, <laughs> you know, uh, things that they think are going to make their their plants really happy because, you know, somebody said a particular micronutrient was good or this fertilizer is what you should have for tomatoes. Um, but if you did a soil test, you might find that you don't need any fancy fertilizer, or you might find that you only need one nutrient um, for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, the three major um, uh, macronutrients. Oftentimes, we have enough phosphorus and potassium in the soil because those tend to be bound up in the soil, whereas nitrogen can wash away over the winter. And so Oftentimes, you'll find that you have plenty of phosphorus and potassium in your soil, and you just need to add nitrogen fertilizer. So um, where that comes into play for integrated pest management, when you have healthy, fast-growing plants, they're more resilient. But also, there's more specific reasons, like if you over-fertilize with nitrogen and you have all this lush uh, growth, that is actually attractive to aphids. So you can create a bigger problem with aphids than you might already have because you've created plants that are growing really quickly with this nice succulent growth and they end up giving off some type of signal that the aphids um, take 
um, take as a signal to come and enjoy the buffet. So, uh, so yeah, just getting the fertility right in your garden can really go a long way with your integrated pest management regime. Um, how about beneficial insects and uh, predatory or parasitoid insects in the garden and using them in, as uh, a control? I always say more insects are better. Anything you can do to attract insects is great. Um, so there's to encourage native populations, uh, you know, there are several things you can do. Um, number one, make sure that they always have something to eat and, you know, something to be on. So, um, so I encourage everybody to augment your vegetable garden with flowers. Alyssum in particular is one that's been shown to be very attractive to beneficial insects. And there's, I saw a study a while ago that actually showed in orchard situations, planting alyssums, uh, alyssum um, between the rows of trees increased beneficial insects in, in the tree canopy. Um, but there's also, you know, plants in the carrot family. Those those tend to be very attractive to insects. Flowers can never hurt. Well, I'm sure there's a way they could, but <laughs> I don't know it. Um, so in addition to be benef being beneficial to, to insects, it's also beneficial to our mental health to have more beautiful flowers. So, um, so that's a way you can naturally um, enhance the native insects and beneficial insects. Also being very careful with pesticides that's way up there on the list as well. And when I say that, I, I mean both with conventional pesticides and with organic pesticides. Sometimes I find that folks think that, that organic pesticides won't hurt anything. And any product that's labeled to kill something will hurt something. So for example, neem is a really commonly used um, pesticide and fungicide in organic farming, but it's actually a broad spectrum insect insecticide. So it's not just going to kill your aphids. You know, if you if you put it on your your plants while they're flowering and there's pollinators there, it will kill your pollinators as well. So just be very, very careful in the types of products that you apply to your garden. People ask about augmenting. So like buying ladybugs at the garden store or, you know, lace wings, things like that. That's that's always fun to do. Um, specifically with ladybugs, I would only do that if you're using them in a greenhouse because they have a, an a, te a tendency to fly away, um, disperse as soon as they're released. They're going to go look for another home that's not necessarily your garden. So even though it's fun, you may not get a benefit from it. So um, just do do research before you import insects. Um, I would see what you can do for your native ones first. So at what point would a gardener want to consider pesticides? I typically recommend um, in the integrated pest management cycle, first, you're going to be using these cultural preventative tactics. Um, then you might try barriers, uh, removal, enhancing you know, the native predators, things like that. If none of that works, then, then that's when you um, start looking at whether pesticides or fungicides or um, other things in that, ca that category are useful. Another place where I I see them applied is I don't I don't want to say an emergency situation but for example on a farm um, if you had a pest situation that was developing rapidly and it it could destroy your whole fall crop of kale for example um, then you might jump to a pesticide faster because at that point it's too late to prevent it's too late to do the more slower acting things so but yeah, just if you're applying any pesticides and fungicides, things like that are there as tools. Um, you just have to be very careful to read the labels, follow the labels exactly, and apply them as they're intended. So are there, you mentioned wind and, and orienting your rows with the wind as a uh, preventative for fungus. Are there other ways to use the weather conditions to help prevent disease or pests? Good question. I think moisture. Uh, moisture is is another in addition to wind sp spreading spores I think moisture is actually our biggest weather condition so for that I mean there's there's definitely ways when dealing with moisture the best thing to do is is make sure that your garden can breathe if that's a, a good way to say it I know there's 
we we want to try intercropping. Um, a lot of folks are doing square foot gardening, um, having really high yield off a small amount of land. But you need to take into consideration the airflow through your garden too. If you're packing everything in, then the water sits on leaves longer, um, and that is conducive to developing fungal or other other diseases. So you just have to experiment with packing in plants, intercropping versus not, um, how much space you leave between the rows. And that can be a huge um, uh, way to impact how moisture behaves in your garden. You can also do drip irrigation instead of overhead irrigation to, um, I guess that's not water, not weather related, but it's water related. Um, and it's a cultural preventative technique that you can employ. You know, siting your garden in the sunniest location possible is another thing. Um, if your garden is sitting in the shade and you're growing crops that aren't okay with partial shade, then they're not going to be growing as fast or as healthy as might be required. And water will sit on the leaves for longer. <laughs> so, yeah, there's just all sorts of little things you can think of. What are some of the resources or tools that are available for people to do their own, some of their own research on? Uh, IPM. It's uh, it's really important when you're when you're researching the pests and diseases in your area to use resources that have been developed for your area. You don't just want to Google something because you might come up with a pest or disease that's only in Mississippi, <laughs> and you know you wouldn't find it here. So some local resources that I would highly recommend include HortSense, like Horticulture Sense. Um, this is a WSU website and. It's broken up into some really into a really easy to use format. Um, so you can choose whether you're dealing with an ornamental plant, a vegetable, and then if you choose vegetable, then you can go down the list and choose tomatoes. And once you've chosen tomatoes, it lists all the pests and diseases that you might find on them. And you can just read through all the options and see what fits. Um, the benefit of that program too is it will list the life cycle of, of the organism. Um, some cultural tactics you can use, biological, mechanical, um, and also chemical. So HortSense is a great WSU resource. Um, you can also look at the Pacific Northwest Disease and Insect Management Handbooks. Those ones are more targeted to farmers, but they do have really relevant information for gardeners as well. You just have to be careful if you get down to the, the chemical um, recommendation sections and uh, just know that many of those chemicals will not be available to you. Um, but typically the ones that are, are labeled for homeowner use or organic use. Another new resource that's being developed is down in Oregon called Solve Pest Problems. Um, it, from what I've seen, it's it's a lot like HortSense. So that that's a, a great one to take a look at. Okay. And we'll link to all of those in the show notes so that people can find them easily. There's there's one more, a really important one that, that I didn't mention is um, going to your local master gardener plant clinic. Sometimes just going online and looking at pictures, you can still get it very wrong because, you know, it's like me trying to diagnose, you know, problems with my chickens. I'm not a vet. I don't know what those, those diseases look like. And so it's really easy for me to go down the wrong path. So if that's your case in plants and you don't feel so confident, well, even if you do feel confident, you should go ask master gardeners um, at a local plant clinic. They'll help you diagnose and find tools that will help uh, manage your, your pest and disease problems. And uh, I'll add to that to, to make it as easy as possible on the master gardeners, if you can bring in an actual sample of the plant so they can examine it under a microscope if they need to, um, and things like that to make it um, rather than just pictures, though in a pinch pictures will will do. Yeah, absolutely. And just because I, I like bugs, I'm, a, I'm an entomologist. Um, if you bring in insects, don't squish them first. Because most of the time, they're good. <laughs> you, want, you want the clinicians to have a great sample to work with. And um, preferably in a container that isn't going to uh, introduce that pest into a new location. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what kind of research is going on right now in vegetables that you can tell us about? Well, um, 
there's always all sorts of great research going on in, in vegetables and integrated pest management. But one project that that I've been involved in is um, is a sweet potato project. We're testing out sweet potato varieties to see which ones will grow well in the Pacific Northwest. And more specifically, we're looking for we're looking at wireworm resistant sweet potatoes. That's a pest we didn't talk about, but wireworms are um, they're the juveniles of click beetles, and they can be a a really bad problem <laughs> if you get them in your garden or on your farm. Um, and since they're they live in the soil and they have a long life cycle in the soil, they're very difficult to to manage um, using organic methods. So. Um, so a great cultural tool to use is to use um, a wireworm resistant sweet potato. And actually that goes for all pests and diseases. If you can get a variety that's resistant, so like cucumbers that are resistant to powdery mildew, why not go for that? Um, anyway, so sweet potato research. Yes, you can grow sweet potatoes in Western Washington. And we're, we're in the middle of doing trials at the the um, WSU research station in Mount Vernon and on local farms throughout Kitsap, Clallam, Jefferson counties, and also some counties in the Puget Sound this year. Is there uh, anything else that you'd like to add about IPM in the vegetable garden? Um, I I think once you get the hang of it, integrated pest management just makes sense as as you walk around your garden and look at things. So um, so don't be afraid of it. Um, just just make it a part of of your gardening process. You know, it's it's always nice to stroll through the garden with a cup of tea and see what's going on, and and that's a big step in the IPM process. So, so have fun while you do it, and get to know your local critters and how to best keep the good ones and manage the bad ones. I just thought of one thing we didn't really talk about much was um, tolerance, because I was just thinking, you know, sometimes you you know, eat lettuce that's been chewed on or, um, you know, things like that, that a lot of gardeners don't, I mean, sometimes I don't even realize that that's what I'm doing is accepting a level of tolerance rather than treating the issue. Can you think of some other examples where that would be the case? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's as definitely as gardeners, you have the power to make choices that allow you to do less work <laughs> or employ um, less harmful techniques. So just because I can't help myself, I, I say that if you have leaf miners in, in your your beet, beet leaves or your chard, why not just eat them because it's extra protein? But that's your choice. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it's it's just there's certain certain pests or diseases that you can choose to tolerate. So if there's a couple bites out of your lettuce, who cares? Uh, I'm not trying to sell it. <laughs> and um, also I think you can help, you know, if you're, if you're um, patronizing a, a local farm stand and they have a couple bites out of, out of their lettuce or, you know, maybe, you know, something's a little bit misshapen or something, it helps to choose to buy that too, to support them in their using fewer tools um, by not looking for perfection. But yeah, there's, I, I also think as gardeners, just because we're proud of what we grow, we're more likely to eat anything that comes up out of the ground. <laughs> Look what I grew. It's ugly, but it tastes good. Yeah. I find myself, we overwinter our potatoes in the garden and um, this time of year, some of them are starting to rot or they've been chewed on. And so I just find myself, I just bring them in the house and I just chop that part off and the rest of the potatoes fine. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, a little bit for the compost, a little bit for you. It's all good. All right. Thanks so much for joining me today. This was a great conversation and hopefully we will teach people about integrated pest management. Yeah, it's been fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Evergreen Thumb brought to you by the WSU Extension Master Gardener Program volunteers and sponsored by the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. We hope that today's discussion has inspired and equipped you with valuable insights to nurture your garden. The Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State is a nonprofit organization whose primary purpose is to provide unifying support and advocacy for WSU Extension Master Gardener programs throughout Washington State. To support the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State, visit www.mastergardenerfoundation.org forward slash donate. 
Whether you're an experienced Master Gardener or just starting out, the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is here to support you every step of the way. WSU Extension Master Gardeners empower and sustain diverse communities with relevant, unbiased, research-based horticulture education. Reach out to your local WSU Extension office to connect with Master Gardeners and tap into a wealth of resources that can help you achieve gardening success. To learn more about the program or how to become a Master Gardener, visit mastergardener.wsu.edu forward slash get hyphen involved. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to stay connected with us, be sure to subscribe to future episodes filled with expert tips, fascinating stories, and practical advice. Don't forget to leave a review and share it with fellow gardeners to spread the joy of gardening. Questions or comments to be addressed in future episodes can be sent to hello at theevergreenthumb.org. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by guests of this podcast are their own and do not imply endorsement by Washington State University or the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. Mm-hmm.